I want to look at some of the illustrations at where God is, or where it was thought that he was, and what that interaction with the people was. And so, the starting illustration is that he's in the pillar of cloud during the Exodus. And we'll also look at the tabernacle, the ark, the temple, and the idea that our body is the temple. And so, going through those, we'll see certain things that are being revealed as far as what kind of nature there is between us and God. And what kinds of things maybe were turned around from how they were supposed to be. And so, we're going to start here in Exodus chapter 13, during the Exodus. And it says, uh, But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. And they took their journey from Succoth and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So here we have that the presence of God is in this pillar of cloud that is going with them. It's what they are, they are following this presence of God, and it goes where they go. And in some sense, what it's saying is that you, you follow the presence of God. It's not quite so much that he goes where you go as... But it still has the, the idea that the congregation of the Lord is with him. That they're moving together. There's not some geographic location that you have to go to in order to get to where he is. He's there moving through the wilderness with them. And so then we have the same kind of illustration with the tabernacle. And one of the interesting things about the tabernacle is that it was a tent made of skins. And so we see in Exodus 35, 7, it says, as far as describing the building of the tabernacle, it says, And ram skins dyed red, and badger skins and shittim wood. And there's tons of, illus uh, tons of details there regarding that is really not what I want to get into at the moment. But there's a lot of symbolism there as far as what these things mean. But the point is that God is traveling with them in a tent of skins and you can kind of even just grasp metaphorically that they're you know we're a tent of skins and here's an interesting thing regarding skins is that um, at the end of the garden tale it says in Genesis 321 unto Adam also unto his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them and then also as another contrast is the story of Jacob and Esau Jacob getting the blessing, and uh, and he put, uh, it says that his mother, she put the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck, and she gave the savory meat and the bread which she had prepared into the hands of her son Jacob. So here's more stories of people being covered with skins, as a, and their animal skins, and it's just another illustration of this idea of the God being in the tent made of skins. And some various twists on it, because the <laughs> I always say that the the interesting thing about this Jacob and Esau story is that it never comes to where Esau says, you know, that wasn't me, and and then Jacob goes, oh, you know, well let me let me revoke what I've given. That's not how it works. He, he doesn't take it back. It's what's done is done. And that's one of the most interesting things to me about that story is the fact that he got what he got through deception and he doesn't get it taken away from him for doing that. Um, so then one of the things in the tabernacle is the, is the ark. And there's 
plenty of more symbolism and detail regarding the Ark. But here's the thing is that the, they bring the Ark into the tabernacle. So they bring the Ark into the Tent of Skins. So in Exodus 40.21 it says, And he brought the Ark into the tabernacle and set up the veil of the covering and covered the Ark of the Testimonies the Lord commanded Moses. And he put the table in the tent of the congregation upon the side of the tabernacle northward without the veil. And he set the bread in order upon it before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses and so on. And here's what's interesting is what's, if you look at the details of what's setting on, uh, how this is set up is that they're having a meal. And that's what this is describing. You know, there's inside the tabernacle, you have the ark with the presence of God and you've got a meal. So it's the, the idea is that you're going to sit and have communion with God and eat a meal. And that's what this is, this is illustrating in, in addition to the other uh, symbolisms involved here. But this is describing sitting down and having a meal. This is not describing a, a, um, a religious ritual type thing. This is talking about going and having dinner with your friend. And that's the kind of illustration you're supposed to get out of it. But the point is that the tabernacle and the ark are mobile. And so they go where the congregation goes. Wherever they go, all this stuff goes with them. God goes with them. They're all mobile. There, there's, no, there's no needing to make a pilgrimage to get to God. There's no journey in order to find where God is. God is where you are. You are where God is. They're traveling together. You're, you're going with each other. And that's the important thing about this illustration. What happened is, is this gets messed up. And we end up with this temple. And the temple gets destroyed, and then it gets rebuilt, and then it gets destroyed again. And since that time, it's never been rebuilt, and I suggest it never will be. So, one thing to look at here is in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 24, it says, An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shall sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, thy sheep, thine oxen. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. So that's an altar of earth. It's just a dirt mound. But also we know that earth is is a metaphorically tied in with man. So it's saying that we are the altar. And so, you know, earth is Adama and Adam is man. So they do tie together in that way. When when you're reading things and you see earth, start thinking about if you can substitute man in there and what kind of meaning that brings. But here it is. It's just a dirt mound to, to do your sacrifices. And then it makes a concession. And it says, and If thou wilt make an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up, a tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. So, it's not supposed to be a stone that you've cut, and it's not supposed to have any steps that you take in order to get up to it. So it's not a reduce in not a reduction in accessibility. And that's hard for me to say. Not a reduction in accessibility. It's not hard to get to. It's not limited in who can go there. It's just, if you're going to make an altar of stone, find a big rock. Use that. That's what it's saying. Um, and so this is not something to, therefore, have be this uh, limited access type thing. And what happens is that then we see even in, in Leviticus that these things start being exclusionary to the Levitical priesthood. And so it starts becoming more and more a thing that unless you're from the tribe of Levi and you're one of the ones appointed to it, you don't get to, you don't get to go there. You don't get to participate in this kind of thing. And it becomes more and more of an exclusive thing where there's all the people looking on at a priesthood that has exclusive rights to access to God's presence. And one of the things I want to look at is in Joshua 22 is that when they're crossing over the Jordan, some of the tribes stay on the other side of the Jordan and they build an altar there. And so then there's a dispute about this because the religious people don't like the idea 
of them having one on their own side. But what this is really about is about the fact that they're they're intelligently and rightly understanding that being on the opposite side of this river, which is already a division, and then if the if the only altar is on the other side of the river, they're going to they're going to fail to have access to this, and then they're going to be told, "Hey, you're not the children of God because you're on the wrong side of the river and you don't have an altar over here." And so the dispute is saying that they're building this in order to sacrifice to other gods and to to rebel against God, and they say, no, that's not at all what's happening. And so it says that, the, uh, verse 23, we have built us an altar to turn, f- uh, oh, no, sorry, uh, before that. Uh, verse 21, then the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh answered and said unto the heads of the thousands of Israel, the Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, he knows, and Israel he shall know, if it be in rebellion or in transgression against the Lord, save us not this day, that we have built us an altar to turn from following the Lord, or if to offer thereon burnt offering or meat offering, or to offer peace offerings thereon, let the Lord himself require it. If we have not rather done it for fear of this thing, saying, in time to come, your children might speak unto our children, saying, what have ye to do with the Lord God of Israel? For the Lord hath made Jordan a border between us and you, ye children of Reuben and children of Gad. Ye have no part in the Lord. So shall your children make our children to cease from fearing the Lord. Therefore we said, let us now prepare to build us an altar, not for burnt offering nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between us and you and our generations after us, that we might do the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings and with our sacrifices and with our peace offerings, that your children might not say to our children in time to come, ye have no part in the Lord. So what they're understanding is that if the only place of worship is on the other side of the river, they're going to start to get excluded. And it's going to start to create a division between the people that they're going to be seen as not having um, any anything to do with God, that they're going to be seen as excluded. They're not the they're not the children anymore. They're not the chosen ones. So this is the first step, but then it gets worse once once the temple is established in saying that, you know, here's the place where God is. And they built this temple and it was cut from stone and it was uh beautiful and wonderful and humongous and it had different levels of access where there was a an outer court where basically anybody could come and then lim- more limited access and then you had the the one place where only the priest could go in after making a sacrifice one time a year and he was the only one allowed in there and it was completely lim- limited access from the presence of God in getting to there and they had 12 steps that led up to that just as we had read that there were not to be any steps up to the altar here it is, when you get to the, the holiest place, which they called the third heaven, that was the the place where the presence of God was, was the third heaven, the holiest place. Only the priest could go in there, only after making his uh, sin atonement. And then he could go in there, and he was the only one that was allowed to go in there, and he went up 12 steps to get there. It was completely the opposite of what is being said about what kind of access to God that there's supposed to be, that God goes with you. Now here it is, you go to God, and then you can't even get there. There's you. The closest you can get is in the inner court, and then you have access to watching the priest go do it for you, and you don't have any access to God yourself. And that's the kind of division that was being fought against when Jesus came and he was not happy with the temple system that they had was that it was divisive. It was telling people that they were separate from God. It was telling people, God is here, you're out there. And so it wasn't a God that went with you in a tent of skins. It wasn't a God that went with you wherever you went in a pillar of cloud. It was a God that was in a temple that you couldn't get to and in a part of the temple that you weren't allowed to go. And this is what is being rejected and overturned in the New Testament. So what they had here is this temple was, it was a monument to a failure to have access to God, really. And this whole entire thing was an idol. It was a Tower of Babel. 
And what we have with the Tower of Babel really is completely misunderstood in, in most uh, interpretations of it. Because what, the, what it's saying is that they had this idea that if they built a tall enough tower, they could reach to where God was. Which means that, first of all, they had an idea, God's out there, we're down here, he's up there. So let's try and get closer to God. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, except that it's kind of like if I'm standing next to you and you're trying to build a tower to reach to where I am and I'm going, hello, um, yeah, I'm right here. Hello, hi, w why are you trying to reach? So the unity in their purpose was that it was a unity in this religious, uh, this faith in the religious temple building that that temple building was going to get them close to God. And so they're unified in this idea of trying to achieve something that they already had. So this is what was reprehensible about it because what would happen is not, it's not that they built the temple high enough and God got scared and said, uh Oh, they're almost here. I better knock them down. It's that they were never going to get there because God was right there with them. God's not in a, a physical location up in the sky or out in space or at the edge of space on planet third heaven. Like, you know, they would build the temple higher and they'd be unified in this purpose of building this temple. We're going to get to God. We're going to finally find God. And the temple would be even higher. And they'd say, you know, did you find God yet? No, not, not yet. Well, now we got to, we got to start over. We got to build the base bigger and they would never cease to attempt to build this temple higher and higher and higher. And so that was the that was the offense was not that they were trying to build a temple and they got too close to God. It's that that method of trying to get to God was completely wrong. It was completely misguided and they would have been unified in that purpose. And so that's what the problem with the Tower of Babel was, was they would be unified in a purpose of trying to achieve something that was stupid. Because you can't build a temple high enough to get to God because God's everywhere at all times. And you're not going to get to a point where, oh, hey, look, there he is. It doesn't work that way. So the, the process needed to be undermined because otherwise that would become the focal point of society would be build this temple higher and we will find God. And so, I mean, I've literally heard some religious people say that they got too close. Well, that's stupid. We have buildings that are significantly taller than anything they could possibly have built back then. And guess what? Nobody's there. Nobody's there. Okay. They didn't build a temple that's higher than, than the highest skyscrapers that we have today. They didn't build a, a, a temple that was higher than our airplanes can fly. You know, there, there's nobody there. Um, that's not the way that you find God. And so that's what had to be undermined about that. It was the idea that God was over there and we're down here. And so that's really what that story is about. And that's completely misrepresented. No surprise there. So since they had the idea that God was in this one place in the temple... They had lost the idea of God going with them wherever they go. And that's a problem. Because then the temple gets destroyed, Babylon comes, and takes the takes them away into captivity into Judah, or into Babylon from Judah. And so now they're not even in Jerusalem anymore. And they've got a destroyed temple, and it's like, okay, well, where is God now? Because he was in this temple that we had. And so... What we see in Ezekiel is Ezekiel chapter 1, and most people think this is a pretty weird-looking description of things that uh, I've seen people spend plenty of time trying to figure out what this is talking about. But what this is talking about is this is just trying to tell them that God is where they are. So what's being described really is a variation of what's called a battle throne, where the king would go and he would sit on a throne in the battlefield and it was a, a throne that was on wheels. And so he could sit on his throne and witness the battle and he would go where the battle was. And so what's being described here is essentially this idea that God's got his own battle throne. He's not stuck in Jerusalem while they're stuck in Babylon. 
he's where they are. He goes where they are. So he's got a battle throne and he goes where they are. And so we see in verses 19 and 20 a real good way to capture the spirit of what this is saying. It says, And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go. And the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. So what's it saying? Where you go, it goes. Where you go, God goes. You are not separate from God. So the temple had this idea that separated you from God, where then in order to help restore this idea that God goes with you, Ezekiel uses the illustration of a throne within a throne. And some of these other things are, you know, probably symbolic of other things. But really the, the point here is that God goes where you go. So God's in Babylon with you. He's not stuck back in Jerusalem trying to get out from buried underneath the rubble where used to be the temple. He's where you are. So you don't need to worry. You don't need to grieve. God goes with you. And that's something that had they not had a temple, had they still been practicing carrying around a tabernacle or something like that, they wouldn't have been subject to needing to be uh, informed, hey, guess what? God goes with you. Um, but it's still not perfect because there's still a location that it's possible to be that you're in one place and that thing is not, is somewhere else. That's one of the great things about what Ezekiel comes up with is this battle throne that just goes wherever you are. So now it's not a physical object carried around. There's no physical object involved. This is why it's got these creatures with the four faces. It's to let you know that we're not talking about something that's that's tangible. Not It's not something you put your hands on that goes with you. This is the Spirit of God that goes with you. And so this is an advancement after going, having taken a step backwards. This is an advancement in the idea that God goes with you, but not in a physical object. And that's a real important advancement. And so now we get into the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 3, 16. It says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. So that's what Ezekiel was getting at when he had that strange vision with the wheel within the wheels. He's seeing a battle throne. God goes with you wherever you go. And so we look in uh, in the Gospel of John chapter 2 and in verse 18. Apparently this is not scrolled at the right place. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So here is Jesus telling us that his body is the temple. And this is what what Paul is getting at in saying that our body is the temple. That to take it even a step further, there doesn't need to be a battle throne that goes with us because God is in us at all times. So it's impossible. It's inseparable. It's intertwined. Where I go, God goes. Where God goes, I am. It's never two different things. And so you can never be separate from God because your body is the temple. And so that's the that's the New Testament advancement of this idea that wherever you go, God's there. And there's no place that God isn't. Because if you are the temple of the of the of the Holy Spirit, if you are the temple of God, then everywhere you are, there's the temple, and then therefore there is God. So the third heaven is no longer this place that you go up 12 steps and you're the high priest and you make an atonement and you go in and you're the only one that's allowed to do it once a year and it's completely inaccessible to all the rest of the people. The third heaven is inside of you and that's where God is inside of you. And so then we, I think this is face to face. Oh no, okay, more on the, the temple. Uh, and so the Jews accused it said, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. So this recalls back to having an altar that you don't hew out of stone. You don't make it with hands. 
you know, so the temple made without hands, the true temple made without hands is the temple made of earth, not earth, the dirt, but earth man. And so that brings us back around to that where the altar is made of Adama, man. The altar is man. And so the, the body that you are in is the temple. And so then what happens is this God who is separate. So, so another one of the things, and this is another study, is face-to-face. -face, but if you're a servant... We, we've lost this a lot in our current society, but if you're a subordinate to somebody, you do not look them in the eye. You do not look them in the face. You keep your eyes down, and that's if you're even allowed to get up off of your knees in their presence and get your face up off the ground in their presence. You, at the very least, point your eyes downward. You have your eyes downcast. You do not look face-to-face -face at your master. And so if you can see God face-to-face, what that is meaning is that God is saying, you are my friend. It says that Moses talked face to face with God as, as a man would talk to a friend. So to see someone face to face is indicating that you are not unequal with each other. And that's just blasphemous. To be able to see God face to face means that he says, you're equal to me. And I'm not going to make you downcast your eyes. And I'm not going to make you bow down on the floor. And I'm not going to make you plant your face in the dirt. And I'm not going to make you get down on your knees. We stand face to face as friends. That's utterly blasphemous. That says that God counts you as equal to himself. And so that's what it means here in uh, Revelation 22. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And so in their foreheads, that's the equivalent of having the thoughts of God. That's what it's saying. That You know, we see in Isaiah, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Well, if you put on the mind of Christ... They're not higher than yours anymore. You're you're up there where he is. You're thinking. You're born above. You're born up above where his his perspective is, and you're seeing it from his perspective with the single eye. That's what it means that you put all these things, all these metaphors together. They're harmonious, but don't systematize them, or it'll get really weird. Um, but that's what it's saying is that you've elevated your way of thinking to God's way of thinking. And so that's what his name in your forehead is, is that your way of thinking has now become the, the mind of Christ. And you see God face to face, because when you put on the mind of Christ, you're not subordinate to God anymore, and God never thought that you were. And that's the thing, is that we've created a tradition of man of being lesser in value, lesser in importance. But God says, no, no, no. You're the treasure, and I'm willing to sell all to have you. So that's not what you do when you think something is of lesser value. That's something you do when you think something is infinitely important. And that's what the illustrations are telling you, is that God does not see you as being of lesser value than himself. So you see him face to face. You see his face. You don't have to down, downcast your eyes. He sees you as an equal to himself. It says that Jesus counted it not robbery, robbery to think himself equal to God. Well, why would it be robbery? Well, because if you're subordinate to him, you keep your eyes downcast. You do not call yourself equal. And he, did not, he, he promoted the idea of saying, no, God sees you as his equal. Your father sees the son as equal to himself. And when you believe this, you are the son that he counts equal to himself. That's what it means to believe in the son, that you're believing that he's right. He's saying that the way the father sees the son is the way the father sees you. When you see yourself in the position of being son, then you see yourself in the same position that he's showing you what he is. And so we see in Ezekiel 37, and we start at verse 22, we see Ezekiel giving us an idea of how, what the, what the new covenant is going to look like. And so it says, And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, 
and they shall no more be two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, but I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and, and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people, and I be their God. And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, and my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. What could be more in the midst than to be in you? And so we see this referenced in Revelation 21. It says, uh, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Now think about this. Behold. That means, you know, that's a, that's a proclamation, an announcement. It's here. Behold. The tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Right? That's what it's saying. You are the temple. Your body is the temple. You contain within you the third heaven. God lives in you. That's what this is saying. God is in your midst. Emmanuel, God with us and within us. This is interesting because later in the ver in the chapter it says, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. No physical temple. There doesn't need to be. We're the temple. God does not need to be worshipped in a temple made of hands. That's what this is saying. He doesn't have this geographic limited access that they had in their blasphemous, idolatrous temple that they built. Um, so Ephesians... What am I looking for here? Uh, chapter 2, starting... Oh, that's why. Starting in verse 13. Closing down. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. That wall of partition, that's a separation. There is no separation. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make himself of twain, that's two, one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and to them that were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together growth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So that last point, you are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. It means everyone is the temple. That's what it means. That's what it says. And so, Ephesians 4.4, 4, There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. <laughs> 